Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's THE student webinar hosted in partnership with Crimson. I'm Jamie Ramakati, head of content for student events here at THE student. And we have a really great session for you today with Harvard alum and Crimson strategist George Baxter. George is going to tell you a little bit about Crimson. He's going to talk about his own experience studying in the US and give you some advice on how to choose the right university. We will leave plenty of time at the end for questions, so please do use the Q&A function to submit your questions for George, and we will endeavor to get to as many of those as we can at the end. George, thank you so much for being with us today, and it is my pleasure to hand things over to you. Thank you so much, Jamie. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here with everybody on the call today. It's always good to be here with um, usually some very, very ambitious young people who are ready to go and uh, choose the universities and, and, and pursue the universities of their dreams. Um, and that's why I work with Crimson. So let me just share my presentation and we'll jump right into things. So today we're going to be talking about applying to overseas universities. Um, in the US, in the UK, and in the EU, in Europe as well. Uh, but before we do that, let's just talk a little bit about who I'm representing today. Who is Crimson? Well, we are a global education company providing holistic support to help students achieve their maximum potential. So we have helped countless students globally uh, put together applications and prepare and strategically work out choices at school, extracurricular activities outside of school, standardized testing, whatever it is that it takes to put you in the driving seat to get into your best universities. And we've been featured in many publications such as Forbes, the Huffington Post, Business Insider, and many others. Uh, and it, as I said a moment ago, it's just a privilege to work at Crimson. Um, I am from the UK myself, as we'll see in a couple of slides. Um, and I decided to pursue uh, overseas study myself. Um, and I wanted to give back. It was the best decision I ever made in my life. And I am still reaping the rewards of making that choice personally and professionally. And I hope that anybody on this call who is excited about studying abroad too, um, we'll consider it further after today's call. So our results uh, speak for themselves. We've, we've actually supported thousands of students like you to gain acceptance into elite universities and our, and our offers range across all of the top Ivy Leagues and other universities outside of the Ivy Leagues in the USA. Um, and uh, we've got you know, offers from universities in the UK as well, including Oxford and Cambridge. Um, over 3,000 offers to the US top 50, over 1,500 to Oxford and Cambridge and other universities in the UK top 10. So just a little bit about me before we, di we dive into the real meat of today's session. Um, my name is George Baxter. I am a strategist at Crimson, which means that I am the, 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 the chief collaborator with the student, the chief mentor who helps the student work out what the best steps are to take to access the universities of their dreams. Uh, I studied at Harvard University myself um, and received a degree in sociology with a secondary field in African American studies, originally from the UK, moved over to the US when I was 18 years old, um, and also received a master's in public policy from University College UCL. Um, and since 2017, when I started working at Crimson as a senior US and UK strategist, I've helped countless students gain admissions to world leading universities, including Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Oxford and Cambridge, Stanford, uh, University of Pennsylvania, Wharton, University of Chicago, the list goes on. And it's, it's, it's a privilege and a pleasure to continue helping ambitious students achieve those dreams. So our agenda for today, we've obviously gone through the introduction. We're going to talk a little bit about the processes uh, for US, UK and EU universities, get a sense of whether you're a good fit or which universities you might be a good fit for, talk a little bit about opportunities after graduation, talk about how Crimson can help. And then of course, as Jamie said a moment ago, we will have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. And again, I want to reiterate, please use the question and answer function in order to, uh, to post your questions. Um, I want to answer as many as I can. Of course, I can be as thorough as I can in the presentation that I provide, but I may not get to some of the things that you want to know. So please ask those questions as we go through and we'll make sure to get to as many as we can at the end. So before we start jumping into specific university systems by country, um, let's look at the top 50 universities by the Times Higher Education rankings. Um, and we see that the US uh, has most of, or has almost half of those top 50 universities, in fact, 23, but then the UK and the EU has eight apiece as well. So these three uh, systems, these three uh, regions have some of, if not most of the best universities in the world. So, you know, it's no wonder that we will be looking to understand why 
the US would be a good fit for us or how to apply to the US, how to apply to the UK, how to apply to the EU. Of course, we see other countries there who are also featured in that top 50 rankings, but the top five themselves feature two from the UK in Oxford and Cambridge and three from the US in the California Institute of Technology, otherwise known as Caltech, Harvard University and Stanford. So starting with the US, uh, so what to expect from a degree in the US? Um, I, the reason why I studied in the US, the reason why I chose to move to the USA to study at Harvard University um, was because of two things, really. Um, I was drawn by the four year degree. Um, I didn't want to stop studying. I wanted to continue learning as much as I could. And of course, being from the UK, uh, the courses are often three years long, four years on average for an undergraduate degree in the USA. But most importantly, or more importantly for me, was the course flexibility. So when you apply to study in the USA, you are at, you're expected to select a major, you know, you're expected to select a major field of study and mine was sociology, but you also are expected to explore outside of your subjects as well. Um, and this comes usually in the form of what are called general education courses within the liberal arts model. So general education courses are usually categories of classes that all students at a particular university are required to take in order to get an interdisciplinary education. So I had to take a class in a mathematical field and a scientific field and uh, a field called culture and belief. And I had to take a foreign language for a year in which I started studying Mandarin, which I had never looked at before and was uh, so honored and so privileged to study. Um, and that worked so well for me. I felt like I became a better sociologist because I was taking classes in all these different fields. Um, I could have taken more sociology classes beyond the ones that were required to fulfill my major. So I did take a few more. I also took courses in economics, I took courses in African-American studies and received a minor in that field as well. And I just felt for me, that was the better option, but that doesn't take anything away from the other systems. It's just a matter of figuring out what is a good fit for you. Uh, also in the US, there's a great focus on extracurricular depth and breadth both in your application and also in your experience when you arrive. Uh, you know, I think most of my experiences or my memories that I feel fondly towards from my US studies were actually in extracurricular activities. Uh, financial aid as well is actually quite readily available at some universities in the USA for international students as well. So definitely don't just balk at the, the sticker price that we see on US universities websites. Many universities do offer generous financial aid if you choose to look for it. There's also this sports culture, which isn't just reserved for TV and movies of US university experiences, it's quite true. Um, you'll find that there's a big culture around watching sports and, and even if you're not interested in those sports, it, it, it's, a, it's a camaraderie that comes from participating. So what are US universities actually looking for in their applicants? Well, we like to say at Crimson, they're looking for a 360 degree student who excels in a particular area, but combined with demonstrated leadership, creativity and initiative. So I also like to say that they're not looking to see who you are just as a student, but they wanna see who you are fully as a person, as a human being. So, you know, yes, grades are important. They're very important as we will see, but what you do outside of the classroom, what you consider to be your strongest values, um, uh, stories, experiences that you've shared that make you the person who you are today. They want to hear about those because they're looking to build a community of students who will all learn and grow thoroughly from each other. And typically the top universities, the likes of Harvard and Stanford and Caltech, they wanna see students who are already demonstrating high levels of initiative, high levels of leadership and impact. Uh, so those are the types of things that the top universities are looking for. But in general, US universities overall are looking for a 360 degree student. And we like to think about it. We like to think about the US application in terms of three pillars. So the first one is academics. Uh, this is probably the most straightforward to understand because the UK, the EU, most country systems put an emphasis on academic levels, right? So you need to be getting the, the, the grade levels that are expected of a student at that university. You need to make sure you're taking a curriculum that is at the rigorous, the most rigorous that you can. Uh, top US universities don't wanna see students that are simply taking easy classes just to get an easy A or an A star or whatever the highest grade is. And then there is also standardized testing, um, which is another data point that can be used for them to assess your academic levels. So it might be the SAT, you may have heard of the SAT or the ACT. Uh, some universities in the US are actually testing optional, so you might not need to take them, but all of these things come together 
in, uh, in, a, in, a, in an assessment, in a measure of how well you're going to fare in that classroom. But I would say that beyond academics, which is a necessity to have high grades for those top universities, it's really the extracurricular activities and then the putting together of the application, the second two pillars that is gonna make or break your chances. So extracurriculars and leadership, as we've said before, we wanna see what you've got involved in. It's ideal for you to show a depth in a certain field so that you have something memorable to showcase, maybe two or three activities within a certain broad base uh, theme of yours. And then they wanna see breadth as well, that you're taking part in many different things. They'd like to see impact, they wanna see leadership, they wanna see initiative, they wanna see whatever you can give. And then on the application side, we have essays. We have the main Common App essay, which is going to go to all universities that you apply to through the Common App portal. And then we also have supplementary essays. So every university will actually ask typically for one or two, maybe more essays so that they can get more information about you, um, recommendation letters, and then also a potential interview. Um, though these days, as we moved into an era post COVID, those are less common. Uh, and typically they're not evaluative, meaning that typically they're not used in the process to determine whether you're gonna be accepted. It's more of an opportunity for you to have a conversation with somebody at the university and both of you can learn more about each other. But these are the three pillars. Uh, and we typically think that 40% would go to academics if we're going to give a, a rough assessment uh, and 30% to the other two. The reason why I would say slightly more for academics is because at all universities in the US, it's a necessity, it's a necessary requirement to be getting the kind of academic levels typically seen of a student at that university. So that opens the door and then the other two categories uh, will kind of knock it out the park for you. They'll ensure that you get that acceptance, but you can't get to that level unless you've got those academic levels already. So we've spoken a lot about the academics. Let's quickly touch more on extracurriculars and leadership. So, you know, like I said, there are many things that you can do, uh, many different activities, many different things that count as an extracurricular, whether that's in school, out of school, something you created yourself, something that you did that was already in existence. Um, and the one quality that we often see at Harvard, uh, sorry, at, at Crimson, excuse me, that, um, that really, well, also Harvard as well, which, which, is, which leads to a successful application, is leadership. So whatever it is that you're interested in, whether you are an eventually into law, or maybe you're an artist, whatever it is that your main thing to we are showcasing leadership in that category. So there are different kinds of leadership. Institutional leadership, this is where you are given the position at school or given a position outside of school at a club. And this is a really, really great way of showcasing that other people will entrust you with responsibility, right? So the university admissions officer will see that and they'll say, great, uh, George clearly is somebody that is entrusted by others. So we feel like we can trust him with leadership as well. Uh, hence a good addition to an application. I actually am starting to see innovative leadership and independent leadership showcasing a greater success for students' applications, which includes creating things that didn't exist before. So not only relying on clubs that were in existence before to give you leadership, but also going out and being innovative, creating your own things. So innovative, starting an app, starting a competition. Maybe you create a club at school that didn't exist before, or maybe you're as bold to create your own startup or nonprofit, which we often see with students that we work with at Crimson. Um, or maybe independent leadership, you want to start a blog or write your own book, um, or maybe you want to fundraise to run a marathon. These are some examples of different kinds of leadership. And these are the things that we like to see for students who are gonna go and make it big and go and achieve big things at US universities. As well as leadership, we like to think of impact levels as well. So often, you know, students will typically reserve themselves to impact at the school level, great place to start. But if you're looking to go to the biggest and the best, I encourage you to think about how can I have uh, impact on a local level or a regional, sometimes national or even international. And here are some examples of ways in which you can do that. So the US application process, the portal that is used to submit your application, most universities will, will um, are subscribed to what's called the Common App. 
or the common application. Um, and within this, you are required to submit a main essay, uh, which will, you will write effectively on whatever you want. You showcase who you are through this piece of writing. Every university receives this. And then each university will ask for supplementary essays, which might ask you, why do you want to study at this university? Tell us about an extracurricular that's really important to you or why is community important to you? These are some of many examples of supplementary prompts that you might cover. You put together your activity list and any awards that you've won. And then you will also put together or you will have put together three references, one from a guidance counselor type of school and two from teachers that can speak to your prowess and your commitment to learning. And then key dates for the Common Application Portal, uh, early round admissions are November 1st, regular round admissions are January 1st. And I could spend an age talking about the difference between these two rounds, um, but just know that typically the admissions rates are higher for an early round admission. So you always wanna consider applying somewhere early as well as applying to others regular. So a quick summary, you have your academics. This is gonna open the door for your extracurriculars, your teacher recommendations and your essays to be considered. And then you might have an interview with an alumni. Um, and really it's in those other pieces that you will showcase whether you are worthy of getting in or not. So what about the UK? What's different about the UK? Well, you can expect a, a three year degree on average, but often there are four year degrees. Um, these four year degrees will often have maybe um, it might be an integrated master's, so you get a master's after four years, or you can often apply for what's called a sandwich course, where you do two years, and then maybe you do one year either abroad or one year in industry within the subject that you're studying, and then you do a fourth year, which is actually your third study year, and you get a bachelor's degree with experience. Um, you decide on your subject or major, whatever you want to call it, before applying, which is, is most common globally, right? We usually are choosing the subject that we want to study, which is different to the US, where most of the time you get to select your major once you're on campus. You don't actually have to choose what you want to study in advance of applying. We say that supercurriculars at Crimson count more than extracurriculars for the UK. Uh, and just to make this very clear, Extracurriculars are just really anything that you can do outside of the classroom um, and supercurriculars specifically are extracurricular activities that build upon what you're learning in the classroom. So if you want to study economics, then, you know, economics related activities are going to count more than non-economics related activities. Uh, and your, your experience is going to be an intensive deep dive into that subject. And um, you have professional pathways much more readily available to you as a student in healthcare, law, architecture, and more. Um, again, I could spend ages talking about professional pathways, but in the US, typically, um, you are not able to study law or medicine at the undergraduate level. Those are postgraduate degrees, whereas in the UK, these professional pathways start from the time that you decide to go to undergraduate, if you so desire. Now, what are the UK universities looking for? Well, um, I would say that whereas the US are looking for a 360 degree picture of who you are, UK universities are fundamentally interested in you as a scholar. So what are you showcasing about your interest in the subject that you wanna study? Combination of leadership within that subject, intelligence, intellectual thought, creativity and initiative, all related to economics, if that's what you want to study, or sociology, if that's what you choose to apply to study. And the weight of the application shows in that direction. So I would say that around about 75%, again, this is not a science, but I would say, you know, around about 75% of the application weighting for all UK universities goes in the direction of academics. What does this actually mean? It means that when you look at a particular course that you want to study in the UK at a UK University, it will publish the expected minimum grade requirements for that subject. So what you need to have received maybe in GCSEs or in your A-levels or your IB or AP or whatever your qualifications are where you are tuning in from, uh, these universities will be able to give you an indication of what the minimum entry requirements are. And if you don't hit those minimum entry requirements, then it's very, very unlikely that you will be qualifiable to get in. Uh, then some universities, namely Oxford and Cambridge, and some specific courses at Warwick and, and other law schools have what's called an admissions test, um, which kind of like the SAT or the ACT, 
um, but slightly different because you can only take it once. You take to showcase your, uh, your aptitude within the subject that you're applying for. We'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, but then 25%, the rest of the application is devoted to uh, writing your personal statement, so showcasing in a piece of writing that all of your university uh, choices receive, why you want to study that subject, why you're a good fit, you'll have one teacher reference, and then for some courses, again it's typically Oxford and Cambridge courses, you will take, uh, you'll have to provide maybe a submitted pit written work or maybe a piece of, uh, of a portfolio um, and then often you might have to have an interview as well. Now the UK application process, uh, the, the, the portal is known as UCAS and within UCAS this is what it usually breaks down to. So teacher reference, personal statement, five choices, so you can't apply to any more than five in the UK, and your grades slash academics, what you've received so far, what your predicted grades are. And then usually when you receive an offer, you receive what's called a conditional offer. So it will say, congratulations, George, you have uh, received an offer to study sociology at University College London. You need, now, you need to now receive a 40 out of 45 in your IB. So I receive that conditional offer and I get in once I receive those, uh, once I fulfill those conditions at the end of my year. Um, but there is a slight difference between um, Oxford and Cambridge courses, um, medicine courses, dentistry courses, veterinar veterinary science courses, um, and other courses in the UK. Um, so the deadline for submitting applications to most courses is January the 15th, or in recent years, it's moved a little bit further beyond to often January the 25th or the 26th. So it's in January, mid to late January. But if you're looking to apply to Oxford or Cambridge, veterinary science, dentistry courses or medicine courses in the UK, then the deadline is October the 15th. So this is a very, very important difference. And you, won't, you only ever submit your application once, right? So um, even if you are applying to another four universities beyond Oxford and or Cambridge, you still need to make sure you submit that application by October the 15th. Otherwise you have missed the deadline for the Oxford and Cambridge. And there are additional requirements um, for you if you are applying to any of these October the 15th courses. So beyond these requirements of the teacher reference, the personal statement, the, you know, picking your five choices and, and listing your grades, you will also have to submit entry examinations and perform at an interview, right? So you've already submitted your grades. You've already done the personal pitch of why you want to study that subject through your personal statement. Your teacher has submitted a reference or a recommendation on your behalf. And then we get to this entry examination. So post October 15th, around about two to three weeks afterwards, you will take one of uh, a, a, an array of entry examinations, most likely. So it could be that you are taking uh, the TSA, which is called the Thinking Skills Assessment. So if you want to study, for example, politics, philosophy and economics at Oxford, they require that you take the TSA. Or if you want to study psychology at Oxford, they also require that you take the TSA. Um, the examples that we have here, BMAT, UCAT and LNAT, the BMAT and the UCAT are two different medical school entry examinations. So many different medical programs in the UK where you have to submit by October the 15th, you will have to take either the BMAT or the UCAT and the LNAT is the law school one. Um, and then for Oxford and Cambridge and those medical courses, um, if you are fortunate enough to have presented a fantastic case through your grades, your personal statement, the teacher recommendation and this entry exam, then you will be invited to an interview. And it's really at the interview that your admission will be determined. So um, once you've gotten through to that round, it's all about doing as well as you can in that interview um, and um, showcasing your love of that subject, your willingness to engage analytically critically, academically with the subject. You will be sitting in front of experts within that subject who will be asking you questions. And you know your responsibility as a young person who is sitting in front of an expert who has been in this industry for a long time is not to show them that you know everything, because that's a lot of pressure, but rather to show them that you love what you're learning, that you're keen to learn more, and you're keen to you know, maybe even make mistakes in the pursuit of learning as much as you can about that subject. So finally, let's move on to talking about the EU. So the EU um, in the top 100 university rankings, we see that actually a quarter of those universities are 
in the EU, including Germany, Netherlands, Switzerland, and France. And you know, some of the most fantastic universities in the world are, are, are featured in some of these countries and many others across Europe. Um, and um, you'll find that there are courses that are English speaking courses, even in countries where obviously, you know, the, 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 de, facto, the de facto predominant language is not English. So you'll find English speaking courses in the Netherlands, in Germany, um, potentially in Switzerland and France as well. Now, what to expect for an EU uh, a degree? Well, four years on average, so more similar than in that case to uh, the USA. You decide on your major before applying, so you apply to study a specific subject. These are relatively more affordable as well, especially if you choose a non-English language program. Those often, in some countries in, the, in Europe, that is free to study at the tertiary level, at the university level. Um, but it is often much more affordable um, than you'll find the sticker prices for the US and the UK. And it's an intensive deep dive right into that major. And the difference between the US, the UK and, and EU universities is that a lot of these universities have their own rules. So depending on your own school curriculum, you might have to spend another year potentially as a student doing a foundation year or you know, different universities will have different requirements. So it's best to check specifically um, which universities you want to study at and what their requirements are. The application process, each university has its own application portal. So there's not a common portal to apply to many universities in Europe. There's no UCAS or, you know, there's no, there's no uh, official UCAS or common app. Uh, but you can apply to as many universities as you have chosen, right? So it's all about how much work you're willing to put in. Um, and EU application deadlines vary, but often they are much later than the Ivy League January 1st last deadline or the Oxford and Cambridge October 15th or you know, the UCAS final deadline of January 26th. Sometimes they go right into the middle of the year. In fact, there are some universities in Europe whose deadlines are still yet to be reached for studying, for starting to study in September. So you know, you've got um, plenty of time to, to, for many universities in Europe. Um, and your university experience is about your degree and your networking. So you're choosing your networking today effectively um, you know sometimes the the networks at universities in Europe can be a little bit more a um, uh, little bit more uh, national so you know building your network be, it, it's 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 more easy to end up having a, a Spanish network if you go to university in Spain than it is to branch out and get an international network within that university so it's, it's you know the onus is really on you as a student at a European university to build a network if you so desire that goes outside of the country that you're studying at. Whereas in the UK and the US, um, these universities are hugely international institutions and people, you know, more, more um, frequently, I would say, are flocking from around the world to study in the UK and, and, and the US. I mean, I did it myself. So just a quick final summary around visas for graduates in the UK, in the US, and, and, and the example in the EU will do for France. So, you know, what can you expect after you have graduated? So in the UK, you can receive a graduate visa, which gives you permission to stay for at least two years after successfully completing a course in the UK. And you can, you can work as a graduate uh, for those two years, which is fantastic. Um, and um, we also have this example, which is a high potential individual visa, where you can apply for this route if you've graduated from an eligible international university in the five years immediately before your application. So if successful, you'll be given a two year work visa. And this is a recent thing. And um, there are many universities that are in the US and, and in the world uh, globally that feature on this list. So it's worth checking if you, know, you, if, if you want to apply to one of these universities because you can then subsequently after graduating, get a high potential individual visa, um, uh, even if you studied in the US or even if you studied at a university um, in, in the EU, depending on which one it is. In the US, you will have access to what's called OPT, um, which is, is called optional practical training. But basically at the end of your student visa, you have 12 months of what's called OPT, which you can use um, and use up to work for those 12 months. Um, and then once that's completed, or if you would like to go on to an H-1B visa, this is what's really known as the working visa, um, you can get an H-1B visa for three years if you have a sponsoring US employer. So you have to be sponsored 
by an employer um, to take you through that H1B process. And it, it, these days it's a lottery because a lot of people are applying for these. So um, sometimes it can be quite tricky to get these, but you are at least guaranteed OPT for a, a year post-graduation. Um, and actually, interestingly enough, if you study a STEM subject in the US, um, any subjects in the science, technology, engineering or mathematics fields, that OPT is extended for a further two years. So you actually get three years of OPT. So it's worth considering whether that is a good choice for you, um, depending on how long you'd like to stay in the US. And then in France, you have the VLT TS visa, which allows international students to stay in France for two years after getting a master's degree or higher. So it'd be a PhD to look for employment and one year after getting a bachelor's degree. So that brings us to the end of the main meat of today's uh, presentation. Very quickly, with two minutes, I'm just going to chat a little bit more about how Crimson could support you, should you be interested, and then we'll get to the Q&A, and Jamie will help me with fielding some of these questions. Um, so what you can do immediately is request a complimentary consultation. Um, so this is a one hour long Zoom meeting with an academic advisor at Crimson who specializes in US and UK and it should be said EU universities as well. Um, and in this session, you'll be able to discuss you, just basically you, you, your interests, your goals and your achievements, what you wanna be doing, um, what your ambitions are, and we will start talking to you about what first steps you would need to take in order to get to that point. So we will provide you with that personalized information. We'll provide a prospectus of you know, the, re the, re the recommendations and the requirements that we would, we would suggest. Um, and then from there, if you decide to continue working with us, then fantastic. But of course, I would always recommend that you get onto one of these complimentary free consultations um, just to learn a little bit more about what you can be doing. Um, it is required that a student and a parent or guardian is attending this consultation though. So check out our website in order to access uh, a free consultation. So that brings us to the Q&A. So um, Jamie, I will ask if you wouldn't mind helping me out with fielding these questions. Absolutely. Quite a good few come in. Yeah, absolutely. George, thank you so much for that presentation. It was incredibly helpful. Um, there's a couple of things I want to mention before we jump into the Q&A. The first is um, I noticed a couple of questions about students inquiring about um, master's or PhD admissions. And obviously the information that George shared with us today is primarily focused on undergraduate admissions. There are lots of resources out there um, via THE student to learn about master's and PhD admissions as well. And I think the one thing to remember about those two is that particularly for PhDs, it's going to be really, really specific to um, what it is that you want to research and, and do your PhD in. And those requirements are going to be vastly different depending on the department and the field of study that you're looking at. The other thing I just want to mention before we jump into the questions is there was a question here about will Australia be covered and although we did not cover Australia today, um, look out for another upcoming webinar later in the summer, it'll be I think at the end of July with THE student and another one of our partners specifically covering studying in Australia so that is coming stay tuned we'll send you some more information about that. And then lastly is just to say there have been a handful of questions about really specific circumstances and although um, Crimson is absolutely equipped to answer those questions on a one on one basis and George mentioned the the opportunity for a consultation, we won't be able to answer questions today that are really specific to your circumstances um, or you know your particular academic record or interests. Um, but with that said, there are some really great questions that I want to dive into. And George, there have been a few that have come in just about scholarship and funding options. And without going into too much detail, again, in terms of, you know, a student's particular circumstances, what can you tell us about what students should be aware of in terms of funding opportunities, specifically in the U.S.? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge minefield of information the uh, financial aid process in the USA, but that should not stop you from diving into it because actually there's a lot of very, very generous institutions in the USA that are willing to give financial aid to international students. So what you're gonna find on your research or where, where if, you, if you work with an expert is that there is something called need blind and need aware. So this is, uh, this is a, 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 a policy that each university will have where they will either be need blind in the admissions process. That means that they won't look at how much you need when making a decision. Or if they're need aware, it means that they will maybe take that into consideration when deciding whether to accept you. 
as well as need blind and need aware, very important to remember, we also have this other kind of um, axiom, which is, will they guarantee that they can meet 100% of what you need? So um, a couple of examples of universities in the USA right now who are both need blind and willing to meet 100% of what you need. There are six of them. We have Harvard, Yale, Princeton, MIT, Dartmouth, and Amherst College. Um, and I can speak from experience. Um, I studied obviously at Harvard University and my family paid less than they would have paid had I studied in the UK. Um, and what's more, I know from working as a previously worked as a tour guide at the Harvard admissions office that around about 20% of students that study at Harvard pay nothing at all because their income levels or their family's income levels mean that the university is willing to cover. And it's not loans, it's full grants for their entire time there. So those are just a few examples of universities that fit that bill. It doesn't mean that you're not going to get money or not going to get in if they're need aware. There are lots of very generous institutions that aren't need aware, but still will accept you if they like to like what they see and they'll give you that funding. So it's just worth saying that while not all of the universities by any means in the US are giving money to international students, there are a fair few um, and it's definitely worth checking it out for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, if I can just add, it's also worth mentioning that a lot of universities automatically review students applications for merit based scholarships mm -hmm. and things like that. So just be sure to include, you know, keep your eyes open for those kinds of things. Again, it's not a guarantee, um, but some universities through their admissions process automatically consider you for awards based on your academic performance or indeed other other qualifications or factors. Um, George, there was a question in here that I think leads into sort of a broader and also very important topic, and it is related to, you know, if a student is attending an online high school or if they go to a high school that doesn't offer a lot of extracurricular activities or a lot of opportunities for awards and recognition and, and, and things outside of the classroom, how is that going to impact their applications? How do universities um, sort of view a student's background and circumstances and, and school that they went to and those kinds of factors when they're reviewing an application? Specifically, this is relevant, I think, to the US, but also a little bit to the UK in the sense that, you know, students have to work really hard in the UK to connect the dots between how they spend their time outside of the classroom and, and what they're interested in studying. So what is your advice to students who maybe don't have a huge array of opportunities at their fingertips? Yeah, I mean, I'll answer this in two ways. So I'll answer for the US and I'll answer for the UK and EU. Um, so with the US, uh, the short answer is that they are very, very understanding of your particular context. In fact, they make great, they take great pains to understand who you are, what your schooling is, what opportunities you had at school, as they go as granular as to understand the curriculum that you can take at school, the extracurricular activities that are on offer at your school, uh, the, the experiences that other students have had, what average grades are at your, at your school. So they will receive a, a packet of information effectively from your school that confirms what you have accessible to you. So you as a student, maybe at, a, at an online school where you don't have access to so many extracurriculars, you're not going to be compared against a student that goes to a brick and mortar school that has an impeccable amount. You're actually just gonna be compared to what you could do given your context, right? So that's really important to know for anybody, you know, you're gonna be compared to what you could do. I will say on top of that, right? That is 100% gonna be considered. I'll speak on behalf of like top 10, top 20, top 30 universities. Sometimes, even in that circumstance, the students that are gonna get into those top universities are usually incredible self-starters, they take the initiative, they're very creative, or at very least they're very innovative and take the initiative. So despite the lack of opportunities that they have at school, they will still be going out there and finding things. And if you're an admissions officer, it's kind of out your hands at that stage. You see a student who maybe had a similar circumstance to you, goes to a school where there aren't that many extracurriculars, and yet still went on to find them that puts that person clearly I mean you know that's not rocket science it just it looks a little bit stronger for that student so I would still encourage you even if you're not at a school that offers a lot of extracurriculars to go and find some for yourself and in fact you're going to gain a lot from going and being a self-starter like that and then just to quickly turn over to the UK and the EU as well with the UK and the EU I typically find that the stronger university applications are the ones uh, where students are talking about things that they did outside of school anyway the readings that they've engaged 
the um, online lectures or the summer programs or whatever it is that they've done to explore that subject further. To be honest with you, typically you find that the ways of exploring those subjects further happens outside of the classroom, happens outside of school anyway. So if I was to put a very long answer short, it's that it will be understood your context, but you know, if, if, if you're really serious about going to those top universities, be a good self-starter, put the work in, dig your heels in and, and, and start going to find those things that will allow you to actually just explore the things that you enjoy anyway. Yeah, absolutely, George, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think as it relates to Europe and um, the UK, I think you said so well, there are so many opportunities outside of school anyway, you know, those taking advantage of lectures or, you know, what are you reading? How do you, how do you spend your time immersing yourself in this subject outside of school is, is so important. Um, so certainly we would encourage students to find those opportunities to help strengthen their application, but also to help them dive deeper into a topic that they, you know, clearly enjoy and love and then can demonstrate in their applications. Mm. Um, we didn't talk much about English language testing. Um, and I wonder if you want to just say a word or two, there've been a few just kind of general questions yeah. about what about English language testing? Is there one that's preferred or not preferred? And I would love to just hear your take and advice on English language testing and, and those requirements. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a great question. And you're, you're absolutely right. It's very, very important um, conversation to be having when it comes to submitting applications to universities in the US, the UK, or English speaking programs in the EU. Um, so if you are at a school where the, uh, where tuition isn't in English, then for 100% you're going to be expected to demonstrate your ability to speak English and that typically comes in the form of taking the IELTS or the TOEFL or many universities now are accepting the Duolingo tests as well which which actually really boomed during Covid um, because it was just a far easier test to, to take so um, in the UK and the US it's worth I, I'm not going to speak in I could speak in generalities but I don't want to do that it's worth taking a look at each university's website to see which ones they accept um, but mo more often than not, the universities are willing to, to accept any of them, but I always find ex examples where they only accept one or they only accept the other. So it's worth taking a look first, the universities are interested in, and then seeing what tests they are willing to accept. There are some ways that you can test out, and that can be in the form of maybe if you are at an English uh, tuition school, like an international school maybe, or maybe you are take you've taken... Uh, GCSE English and or a, a qualification and gotten a certain grade which really shows that or you took the SAT and you got a certain score in the English section you know there are many ways of testing out and again you can usually find this information online um, but uh, for sure it is required um, and uh, some universities will also kind of post the levels that they expect so just find all that information on universities websites and and you should be should be fine. Excellent. Thank you. We have just a couple of minutes left and there's a question here that I think is a perfect way to end and it's really just kind of asking about what kinds of skills are important when jumping from, you know, uni high school life in your home country to university life abroad like what what kind of student is going to be really successful in, in that environment. I'm going to ask you that first half of the question, but I think there's another half of the question that I also want to explore, which is what kinds of skills did you develop as a student studying away from home? And how did that really help you develop your character and sort of life skills beyond what you learned in your degree program? So sort of two halves of that question in terms of those um, non-technical soft skills that are really gonna continue to serve you after university and beyond. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember when I was at school, uh, our teachers would always say, if you miss a deadline at university that's you know you can't you can't make up for it and that was the case right so i know i had to leave everybody it, not many people arrive at uh, a university especially a university that's uh, that, that that's a very um very very good at very good levels and um and has the time management skills down right like you learn time management as you go through and especially at us university where there's such an emphasis on balancing your academics with your extracurricular activities as well. So that, you know, time management, or just at least being intentional with your time management um, early on before you go to university will definitely put you in good stead. Um, being, you know, university campuses are, um, are always looking to build community. That's what I actually really think their biggest value add is. Um, not only what you're studying, but also your ability to, 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 to convene with 
a diverse population of human beings from all around the world who bring different perspectives and ideas and and not everybody always agrees but everybody comes together because you know that's that that's what it's all about and I think um being willing to to, to understand different people and understand different perspectives was also something that I I loved and I'd love to gain uh, that I gained from my university experience and the final thing I'll say as well um I was, uh, and I haven't said this to Jamie yet, I was the most homesick child in the world when I was growing up. I used to, I hated leaving my family for even a day, let alone four years. So I was, when I got in, I thought, why on earth am I doing this? I don't know why I'm going to the other side of the world. And within the six weeks that um, I got there, and then we had what was called freshman parents weekend, and my parents came to visit. They, they, they won't mind me saying this, I kind of forgot my parents existed. I got <laughs> so sucked into it. Um, and had such an incredible experience, you know, head first, I dived into the experiences that I had there. Um, and again, I have the community to thank. They really build, especially for international students at these universities, they really build a sense of community so that you don't, you can you feel like you're part of a home away from home. Yeah. George, I think that's a perfect note to end on. Thank you so much for your time, for sharing your tips, your advice, your expertise. Um, I'd like to remind the students who are here that they can get in touch with Crimson for that complimentary consultation. Obviously, lots of questions that we didn't get to, unfortunately, but also lots of questions from students about their particular circumstances. And I think it's a great opportunity for them to just um, get in touch with Crimson and explore some of those questions and queries a bit more and start to dig into the process a little bit deeper. So thanks again for your time. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And we will see you next time at the next THE student webinar. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.